Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Clark, research analyst with Money Markets here sitting down with Green Zone Fortunes co-editor Charles Sizemore it is another episode of Investing with Charles. Now, uh, Charles is is back in Peru uh, this week, so uh, we, we, we get the uh, benefit of uh, co- talking to him from South America. Uh, or maybe that's not a benefit. I, I really don't know. I've never been to Peru. I'd like to go, but I, I, I've not I've not made the trek. Don't, don't go this time of year. If, if I could move the camera out the window, you would see uh, this odd grayness that just sort of like the sky blends in with the, the pavement, which blends in with the buildings. It's this weird gray. In about another six weeks, it'll be sunshiny and beautiful. It'll look like San Diego. Come then. Okay, I expect uh, I, I expect my ticket to be in the mail digitally. Uh, from you to come down in uh, in in sometime in October, so I'll be waiting for that. Air, air miles are in the mail. Yep, they, perfect. Um, now today, I, I you know, there's always this onus uh, for a lot of investors to not just invest in stocks. Okay, it's not they they, they want more than that. They they want to expand that. They want to get their stocks, their 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 positions to work more for them, and it's more than just gains. Uh, and just trying to pick out that right uh, that right stock. For a lot of investors, they are looking at a, a critical dividend, and this is basically an uh, you know a company pays you as a shareholder as a thank you for owning your shares of the company. And these range these percentages range all over the map. There are companies that are at two percent. Uh, forward annual dividend yield. There are some that are there are companies that are as high as eight, nine, ten. 12%. And I'm sure you know of even more. Well, but I, I want to as, as a as a frame of reference, the, the S&P 500 yield is about I think 1.6, you know, it's yeah. it's in that that ballpark. So right. that's, you know, the, the typical stock in the US market right now yields about a little over 1.5%. Right, which is not necessarily spectacular. You're not um, getting rich on that. No. Um it's not bad, but it certainly isn't great. Now, Charles actually does a very, very good job of digging through and finding not just high dividend paying stocks, but smart high paying dividend stocks, meaning any company can pay a dividend and some companies actually raise their dividend, which sounds very attractive in headlines, but they're doing it because they're trying to keep their investors uh, to stay with them because the price has dropped off. So they're using their profits to, to say, hey, stay with us, stick with us, it's going to be okay. Other companies are raising their dividend because it's just financially prudent to do so. It makes sense. We've made money. We've done very well. Let's reward our shareholders. The important thing is trying to find the difference between the two. And one area in particular that we've talked about before here on YouTube and, and are probably going to continue to talk about is REITs. These are real estate investment trusts. Um, these are uh, companies that have very low overhead. They basically own property, lease them back out uh, at, to, to other companies to use for whatever, uh, whatever they're using, whether it's for offices, for uh, 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 warehouses, for you know, re- residential, whatever. Now, Charles, I want to ask you, you know, if, if I had to kind of put, your, put a gun to your head, which we, uh, which we don't do, but it's a, a reference we use often here. Um, I believe it know, is legal to do so in Florida and Texas. It is, um, yeah, yeah, kind of, um, <laughs> but I wouldn't encourage you to actually do it. Um, you know, I want to, I, I want you to give me your take on on a REIT uh, or, or on REITs in, in general, and, and tell me, you know, do you have your eye on a, a a REIT that is particularly good in terms of dividend, but not a dividend that's oversold? Yeah. So, a um, little little background first. So, you know, what is a REIT? You know, a publicly traded slumlord. Yeah, this, this is a real estate company that- You're really making from. the case when you jump out of the gate with that. You, <laughs> really, you really nail it home whenever you say it's basically a publicly traded slumlord. That's- but, uh, but, you know, it's, everyone wants to be a slumlord. You collect those rent checks and uh, you're the king of the castle there. But no, it, it, REITs are great. It, it's a great uh, legal structure because REITs do not pay any federal income tax so long as they distribute 90% of their profits in the form of dividends. And so obviously when you're not paying federal income tax, that creates more money that you can then distribute as dividends. REITs tend to be a very high yielding uh, part of the uh, corner of the market, if you will. Now, um, where that gets, where there are different shades of REIT on this. You know, what, when, you, when you talk about REITs, you're normally talking about what's called an equity REIT, which owns real property. 
hotels, apartments, office buildings, cell towers, whatever, but there is a tangible piece of property there for whom somebody is collecting rent and then recycling that rent into a dividend. There's another corner of the market that's, that's different, mortgage REITs. Mortgage REITs don't, uh, well, there could be hybrids that own a little bit of everything, but like a pure mortgage REIT does not own real property. They own mortgages and mortgage-related uh, investments, uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, MBS, not to be confused with the, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. That's a different MBS. The MBS we're talking about is, is mortgage-backed securities. So, so mortgage REITs will do that. They get the same tax benefits as an equity REIT, so long as they, because mortgages are, at the end of the day, a piece of paper secured by, by real estate. And even mortgage derivatives, it, eventually that ties back to some piece of real estate. If it's a mortgage bond owned by a, a CMO, owned by an MBS, whatever. If, if it's this alphabet soup kind of Russian, you know, nested doll of things that own other things that own other things, there's still a piece of real estate backing that up somewhere, right? And and that's why they they benefit from from that same um, beneficial taxation. Now, mortgage REITs are fun because they, um, well, they're fun at the right time. What these guys do is, you know, they, they buy up a pool of mortgage related assets and they lever it up. Why do they lever it up? Because you see what mortgage rates are today. Mortgage rates are near historic lows. You don't really want to invest just in mortgages. It's not going to pay enough to be interesting, right? But if you can lever that up, if you can borrow cheaply and lever it 10 to 1 or 5 to 1, all of a sudden things can get a lot more interesting. And that's what mortgage REITs do. They borrow very cheaply generally you know, short-term interest rates, and then they recycle that into buying mortgages and mortgage-related securities. The result is you get some of the highest yields in the market virtually all the time. Uh, right now, um, you see mortgage, you know, mortgage REITs yielding between you know, 7 and 10%. Um, I'd say the, the bulk of them are kind of closer to that 8 and 9 range, but 7 to 10 is, is, is kind of the, the broad range. Of, of that asset class right now. Now, obviously, there's a time you want to do this, and there's a time you don't. Right now, the yield curve is really steep. And what I mean by that is short-term rates are zero or very close to zero. Longer-term rates are more definitively positive. And so yeah, it, there is a, a very clear distinction between short-term and long-term rates. That's, that's nirvana for, for mortgage REITs. They're able to borrow at effectively zero and then recycle that into something yielding substantially more than zero. That's a license to mint money. Now, there are times when you don't want to own mortgage REITs, and that's when the yield curve is more flat or inverted. A nightmare scenario for these guys are when you know, the Fed is aggressively trying to fight inflation, they're, they're, they're jacking interest rates up. When they do that, um, the, the whole model really becomes unprofitable at that point. Mortgage REITs tend to deleverage. They tend to hedge with, with derivatives or whatnot. But as, as, you know, at the end of the day, their model just isn't as good. It's not as profitable in that, in that environment. Well, what, what do we have today? You know, today, again, rates are at zero, effectively. The Fed has made noise about raising rates, but they're not going to do it tomorrow. It's going to happen whenever it starts. If it's next week or three years from now, it's going to start slowly and, and build. So we have a window of time in which to operate here. So that's, you know, that's the dynamics of mortgage REITs. That's why they're interesting. And this is a really nice, sweet spot for them. And I was going to ask you about where the Fed's taper uh, comes into play here, uh, because I, you know, I think we've seen that it is, it is going to happen. There's been a lot of rumblings about it. We've heard uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell talk about it. We've had, uh, uh, you know, Rafael Bostic, who's the Atlanta Fed Chair. Uh, you know, he's talked about it a lot. Several Fed uh, presidents have have said that it's going to happen. It's just a question of when, and then more importantly how. Um, so when this taper does come into effect and they, they taper off the buying of, uh, of bonds, they start pushing interest rates higher. And by higher, I don't necessarily mean they're going to you know, jump it to four. Um, we're looking at a gradual, a, a very stepped process here. Um, is there a particular time for an investor in a mortgage REIT to say, okay, this is now when I need to get out? What, what, is, that, what is that time frame? 
I would say once the Fed starts raising short-term rates, or you know, the, the, sometimes the yield curve moves completely independently of what the Fed does. You know, the long the Fed affects the longer-term reaches of the yield curve, but it doesn't directly control them. It, it's it's more of a it, it influences them, but it doesn't control them per se. So if you do see the yield curve starting to flatten, or you know, show any indication that it might invert. At that point, it's probably time to sell your mortgage REITs and, and move on. Um, some of these guys do a really good job of hedging, some of them not as good, but e even the ones that do a really good job of hedging, it's a difficult environment for them. It's just not an ideal time to be in this. You, you really would not have wanted to be in mortgage REITs in 2018 and 19, for example. It was just not the best window. There's always exceptions. There's always something on sale, sure. But as a general rule, you want to avoid the asset class when the yield curve is, is flat or flattening. You want to be in it when it's steep or steepening. Um, right now, you know, the, the yield curve is steep. It's going to get less steep when the Fed starts to raise rates, presumably. Um, when that happens, we'll know they're going to announce it. They, the, the Fed has made it very clear that they are not interested in surprising anybody. They're going to telegraph what they're doing. So we'll have a really long runway to you know, gently exit the asset class and collect dividends along the way. Um, and one last question. Is there a particular mortgage REIT that you have your eye on? Yeah, so in Money and Markets uh, last week, I actually recommended uh, Chimera. Um, Chimera Investment Corp is um, a really solid uh, mortgage REIT that owns a mixture of agency and non-agency um, mortgage securities. And what that means in plain English is some of what they own is backstopped by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, some is not. The fact that some is not uh, actually does give them a little bit more juice, gives them a little bit more yield than if it was purely a, an agency um, agency only portfolio. So I, I like it. It's a it's a solid uh, it's it's a solid player. They survived what was a very difficult 2020. The way I look at it, any mortgage REIT that survived 2020 in one piece is a mortgage REIT that can survive the apocalypse. And uh, just for reference, uh, Chimera Investment Corporation trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Its ticker symbol is CIM. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking at its, uh, at its information now. It does, it does invest in a portfolio of mortgage assets, residential mortgage loans, agency and non-agency, uh, residential mortgage-backed securities, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, one to check out for you is uh, Chimera Investment Corp. Trades on the New York Stock Exchange, CIM. Charles, anything else you want to add about mortgage, uh, mortgage REITs today? Well, we're in, a, we're in a low yield world right now. And, you know, I, I tell people to be realistic. You, know, you can't have a 10% yielding portfolio in this environment without taking crazy risk. A, a typical, you know, a really good high quality equity REIT might yield 4% right now, 4.5%. And that's okay. I mean, that's what the market's giving us. But it's also okay to stretch with part of your portfolio. You don't want to have your entire income portfolio in mortgage REITs. That would be crazy. Right? Like they're too volatile to, to have you know, a huge chunk of your net worth. But, you know, of your income portfolio, what about putting, you know, 5%, 10% into these kind of yield stretches? I think that's fine. That's a big enough portion to where if you do have some volatility and you're not able to get out in time, yeah, I mean, you, may, you may take a little bit of a haircut when you sell, but it's not going to destroy your portfolio. But it will give you a little bit higher overall portfolio yield. So adding these into the mix is a really nice addition don't get carried away. Don't just put your entire nest egg in them. But again, a, a, an allocation of these can really boost your overall yield without adding too much additional risk. And just as a point of reference, as of what I'm checking this right now, which is a little slow here, but uh, according to the Department of the Treasury, the 10-year yield is 1.3. Uh, the one-year yield is 0 0.08. So just to give you some perspective uh, on, on where the yield, uh, the yield curve rate is, uh, right now. So Charles, uh, definitely appreciate you taking time and joining us uh, as you do each and every week. We've got much, much more we're going to talk about. Make sure uh, that uh, if you uh, are new to our YouTube channel, make sure you do subscribe, click that subscribe button and match the notification bell. Get notified each and every time we put out a new video. We've got a ton of stuff out there. Uh, we've got the marijuana market update, which we put out every week. Obviously, you've seen investing with Charles. Uh, we also have Ask Adam Anything and the Bull and the Bear podcast, plus much, much more. We have a uh, paid membership program as well. You can click join on our uh, YouTube homepage. You can find out more about 
about what you get with that. We're looking to expand that membership program right now. We're uh, kind of into cannabis, uh, but we're looking to expand that out even more. So uh, now would be a good time to check that out and maybe even jump into uh, our, our paid membership program where you get even more content than what we have here on YouTube. And also don't forget about the, the mothership, moneymarkets.com. Check it out each and every day. Charles, myself, Adam, our entire team, we work seven days a week uh, to make sure that we are providing you safe, sound, smart, simple, profitable investment information for your portfolio. So for Greens on Fortunes co-editor, Charles Sizemore, I am Money Markets uh, Research Analyst, Matt Clark, wishing everyone safe trading.